There is intrigue. Uh, we have uh, several reasons to be very delighted and honored uh, for your visits. Um, first, uh, you have been uh, uh, one of the pioneers on the not of the metal treatment, but also of uh, the modern uh, research on addiction. And uh, you are still very active in this field. And uh, uh, what uh, could be your message uh, uh, after this uh, Congress uh, THS death? Of course, you. Many years ago, you have been uh, several times in the THS, and uh, uh, today, uh, what would be your message? Well, with respect to the conference itself, I think you, Jean-Pierre, and your colleagues around you have done a magnificent and magnificent job of putting together a very vibrant and informative meeting with people primarily from France, and Spain, but also from all other parts of the world. And I find that the meeting now has grown and matured to a very exciting one that balances science and clinical research with humanism and concern for the patient and concern for society as a whole. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, um, out of the meeting, um, after a lot of uh, travel in France, um, how is your view? What do you do, what do you believe uh, about the evolution of the uh, drug addiction treatment in France? Because we are maybe the alone country who have uh, methadone treatment, but uh, uh, more buprenorphine treatment than the methadone, but without at the moment without the suboxone. Because uh, we have a debate in France, um, some people told it's not different uh, injecting uh, Subotex and uh, Suboxone. <laughs> well, I think we know that simply isn't the case. There have been two or three published studies. Mm -hmm. However, some had the expectation that adding naloxone to buprenorphine would prevent all of the buprenorphine's effects. No, when we were afraid that methadone would be abused parentally, and we in fact published paper, which you probably have read, on plasma levels of methadone after methadone alone or methadone buprenorphine, uh, bupre, uh, naloxone. And we showed in the naloxone methadone paper that the naloxone in no way took away from the beneficial effects of methadone. Why? Naloxone is rapidly metabolized by the liver in the first passage through the liver. And when you use naloxone in an overdose situation, you have to intravenously inject it. So we knew that naloxone methadone did not detract from the methadone effects, but would block any high from intravenous methadone. We were soon to learn that methadone is an extraordinarily boring drug. If it's injected, it binds to plasma proteins, and people given it on a blinded basis don't feel it at all. Buprenorphine, not so. If it's injected, one does get a high. But if one puts in naloxone, but it blocks the first 15 to 30 minutes the high, it doesn't block the effects after that. But it blocks that first period. It has zero downside, zero unfortunate effects when given sublingually, which is the intended route of administration. I actually know of no instance where one should use buprenorphine naloxone and just do away with buprenorphine alone. One gets away with the abuse liability but doesn't deter in any way the effectiveness. Now you have the same problem in France that we have in US with respect to methadone. So when you've got methadone and buprenorphine, methadone is overregulated. And although I don't wish to say buprenorphine is underregulated, you did hear me raise several times questions about do the patients have appropriate and immediate access to counseling, to medical care, and psychiatric care. We also know in US, and I know it's true here in France, methadone is overregulated. You heard me ask questions about medical maintenance. Well, it really doesn't exist in any country except US, and now Sweden. I was able to introduce it in Sweden. But after whatever the 
tolerance of acceptance is, once patients do well in methadone, then they may progress to medical maintenance where the methadone is prescribed by either a general physician or a psychiatrist mm -hmm. or a specialist in internal medicine. But the patient must come to a methadone clinic initially and they must be attached to a methadone clinic in case problems arise. Now when we developed that concept in 1984, we put very tough limits. We said they had to be in methadone treatment for five years. That's absurdly long. And now the criteria in most places is one year of successful performance. But even that is too great unless you have really fine methadone programs. So I think in France and in the US we need to do two things. We have to decrease, not deregulate, but decrease the regulations on methadone to allow progression, change the fact that you had to have one whole year of multiple daily self-injections of heroin to get into methadone treatment. That also is too long. The concept of daily multiple injections is very sound. That should be the criteria for methadone or buprenorphine, not just DSM-4 criteria. I think we should have equal access to methadone or buprenorphine. For induction, you would choose whichever would seem to be better. Somebody with a low degree of tolerance, fewer years of addiction, I would probably start with buprenorphine because you can move seamlessly onto methadone. And whenever I say buprenorphine, I mean buprenorphine naloxone, never buprenorphine alone. And then one can uh, uh, choose for people to start methadone, those that have years of addiction, using very high amounts of heroin or other short-acting opiate. And they will do better. And uh, do they have uh, any data or um, a possibility to uh, choose uh, methadone better than uh, buprenorphine or uh, buprenorphine than uh, methadone? We have some clinics that have opened that choice. Not enough. But it, if you don't have medical maintenance, a lot of people say, I think I want to be on buprenorphine so I don't have to come into a clinic every day or twice a week for life. On the other hand, if you have medical maintenance and people know they can progress after a year or so into that, the actual numbers, most people are favoring methadone over buprenorphine. But there needs to be a choice, doesn't there, in medicine? Sometimes we know people do better on one medication for blood pressure and other patients will do better on another. And you don't always know why. So if I were doing the best of all possible worlds, anybody with daily multiple use of a short-acting opiate would come into a treatment program that would be nice. That means wall-painted, caring staff, and a receptionist that says, hi, Johnny, how are you, and not you junkie. Mm. And I would have a physician who would see each patient intermittently, not daily, but intermittently, certainly do an evaluation of their medical and psychiatric status. And I would have counselors available who would contact, and probably groups. And then I would see what services are needed for which patient, start them on treatment, increase their dose, if they start with buprenorphine and it's not adequate. Because we do know that the top dose of buprenorphine naloxone or buprenorphine alone that can be used with increasing effects in humans is 32 mg sublingually. That's equivalent, and many studies have shown this, to about 70 milligrams of methadone. And yet studies beginning in our studies in 1964, going right up to what we heard two presentations on today, have shown that the majority of heroin addicts need 80 to 150 milligrams a day of methadone. So the buprenorphine isn't really quite adequate. And some people are accepting that lower than adequate to be able not to have to go to clinic every day. The last question. We, we have in France a very strong uh, debate, discussion, uh, into the uh, professional, into the doctors and the uh, nurses, uh, on, the, on the point of, uh, about the problem. When uh, we have to stop or to decrease and to stop a maintenance treatment? So I think the bottom line is, for most, probably lifelong very long-term treatment. For some, may be able to come off and do very well. But the most tragic thing, and we did it to young people in the 70s, when we saw young people under 21 with years of heroin addiction come into treatment at age 15, 16, 
we thought surely they can come off sooner because their brain can't possibly be as badly altered. And parenthetically, we now know from our road studies, the adolescent exposed is much worse off than the adult exposed, much worse with more persistence. Mm. So we're very much in favor of just say no when you're a teenager <laughs> and frankly beyond. But mm. if they start using, mm -mm. I think we have to be ready to treat and treat over a long term. Uh -huh. And I think we have to just do that. But don't be fearful of it. Again, <laughs> I frequently now in my own mm. upfront way, mm. when somebody asks the question of when they're going to come off methadone or come off buprenorphine, mm. I will look at them very intently and say, why did you ask that question? What problem do you have with treating addiction? And you can watch people start to squirm because then it all rolls out, be they a physician or a policymaker. Mm -hmm. You can take them down the line of it costs to treat, ah, how much does it cost to go to prison? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to treat AIDS or mm -hmm. Hep C or have a liver transplant? It costs to treat an addiction, nothing compared with societal costs, mm -hmm. healthcare and otherwise. You don't want to treat them because you think the medication is evil. The medication, good for chronic pain, evil for treatment of addiction. So what you're saying is you don't think addiction is a disease, and we come back to that. Mm. And remember our hypothesis of 64, that now is well proven that addictions are diseases mm. of the brain with persistent and measurable changes in the brain. We didn't have the way to measure them, and we do now, and we do it. You know, these are not fantasies or personality mm. disorders or criminal <laughs> behaviors. But that needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught head on. I would start in every medical school, law school, nursing <laughs> school, and social work school. Mm. Policymakers are funny worldwide. I have learned they do what they think their constituency wants them to do. Mm. They actually are very, very dependent mm. on mm. their constituency ideology. Mm. So once you can reach a policymaker who's really got strength, mm. then you have a courageous person who will get up and say, what do you mean addictions aren't diseases? But it takes a